of Webinar on Innovation in Agribusiness. I am Christian Maciel and I'll be the moderator of this webinar. I'm agronomist, doctor in agricultural engineering and patent examiner at the National Institute of Industrial Property, the Brazilian Patent Office. This webinar is held within the scope of a partnership between Brazil and Denmark as part of the agenda defined in an innovation cooperation agreement signed in October 2019 between the Brazilian Patent Office and the Royal Danish Embassy in Brazil. This initiative is aimed at companies and researchers interested in collaboration on joint innovative tech solutions for agribusiness. So this webinar is intended to establish a bilateral innovation network fostering new partnerships, R&D co-development, and joint research projects. So I would like to invite all the participants, those who are intended to engage in further cooperation with the Brazilian companies and universities to fill up the form for collaboration proposals. The link to the online form you can find at the chat of Zoom. Now I would like to speak a little bit of agribusiness in Brazil. Agribusiness is very important to Brazil's economy. And in the last year, the gross domestic product of Brazilian agribusiness increased by 3.81%, representing 21.4% of Brazilian GDP. Among the segments, 68% of this value corresponds to the agricultural sector, while livestock corresponds to 32%. But in the year of 2019, the livestock sector increased an expressive 23.71%, while the agricultural sector decreased 30.3.46%. Brazil is the world's, world's largest producer of coffee and orange juice, the second in the production of sugar, soybeans, beef, and chicken and the third in production of corn. As for international trade, 43% of Brazilian exports in the year of 2019 were from agribusiness products. Nowadays, Brazil is the largest exporter of sugar, coffee, orange juice, soybeans, beef, and frozen poultry. The third largest exporter of corn and the fourth of pork. And even if the coronavirus pandemic, the agriculture exports increased 10% in the first half of this year, compared to the first six months of last year. The agribusiness sector absorbs practically one out of three Brazilian workers. In the year of 2015, 30.5 million out of a total of 94.4 million Brazilian workers were employed in agribusiness. So, in the second day of webinar, we will have here the following companies. Sky Drones, represented by Ulf Bogdawa. Jay Assi, represented by Jose Assi. Just Biosolutions, represented by Ana Paula Justiniano. And Intergado, represented by Luigi Cavalcante. These four companies represent agricultural tech solutions within pest control, planting equipment, organic fertilizers, and precision livestock. Before the beginning of the presentations, I would like to invite Professor Klaus Sorensen to join us in the webinar. Professor Klaus Sorensen is a professor of the Center for Marketing, the Department of Engineering of Aarhus University in Denmark and he will make a contextualization in the Danish agricultural sector and precision farming. Please welcome Professor Klaus. Thank you very much, Christian, for this nice introduction. I will just try to share my screen. Okay, it's okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christian, for this nice introduction. As uh, you can see here, I'm uh, uh, working at Aarhus University in Denmark, uh, head of a research unit on operations management and also building up a, a, a head of a smart farming center at the university. So I will. Mm. Okay, uh, just a few words about this center, which I think in, in many ways encapsulates what uh, we are trying to do in research and development in Denmark, but also what what way what. The, what trends and development trends you see in, in Danish agriculture. So I think even if precision farming has not been implemented as much as we like, we are now moving into something we could call smart farming, farming 4.0, where we more look at not individual technologies, but also the whole system and how the, the whole, te all technologies connect to the whole farming system. And, uh, and, and why we are able to do that today is that we have a lot of new uh, technologies available uh, within information and technology, uh, communication uh, systems, uh, internet of things, uh, automation technologies, and uh, etc. cetera. And uh, that enables us to move ahead and beyond precision farming. And what we are really trying to do is that we are trying to optimize the usage of systems instead of just scaling technology. Because what we have seen in many years is that you're making the machines bigger and bigger in terms of efficiency. But that has some negative consequences in terms of maybe energy consumption, uh, soil compaction, etc. So the key now is that you should optimize the machines you already have, or maybe even move into robotics with smaller machines. What we are facing with on a, not only in Denmark, on European or global scale, of course, is challenges within food security. We have to produce food in a sustainable way, in a climate friendly way. We have to produce food that is both quality, both has sufficient quality and is safe for the consumer. We have to minimize energy consumption. We have also to, to, to remember to integrate the human being in this, all these new technological developments. So the social aspects are also important. So what are the challenges when we are trying to develop these two new technologies? You can see here to the right, is that we still have systems that don't connect easily. We have problems of, of uh, who owns data that are being collected. We have problems of uh, training uh, farmers and other users in using these new technologies or even these new technologies are not sufficiently user-friendly. And you can also say that this new development toward digital farming, it really changed the whole way of doing farming because you are, you are experiencing new ways of doing things. You are experiencing new ways of knowing things and new ways of interaction. So it's, really more than technology it's much more than technology these that these changes that we will see in the in the coming future but back to precision agriculture and for example how is that being how is that being adopted by farmers because that could also give an indication on how they will adopt even more advanced technologies here you see some uh, some numbers for the uh, uh, adoption of technologies, precision farming technologies for, for, for Danish farmers from, from two years ago. And you can see, for example, 
of an overall basis, precision agriculture, precision technology is being adopted by 23% of the farms, but 57% of, of the area is using these technologies. So again, we have the indication that it's the big farms, the large farms that adopt these technologies. And then you can see some of more specifically some of the technologies of course guidance systems have been adopted widely a section control of sprayers nitrogen application and then you see some of the more advanced technologies on images from satellite and drones and other crop sensors they are also being adopted but to a smaller degree what are the what are the reasons why these technologies are not being adopted more and here you can see some of the numbers for for farmers that, that that don't use these technologies what do they state as their main reason of not adopting these technologies too high costs difficult to make the technology work too maybe the technology will not benefit you for example if you have very homo homogeneous fields then precision application of nitrogen and spraying is maybe not so relevant again lack of competence and knowledge on using the systems and then some other uh, uh, reasons so here we see some of the uh, adoption issues that we have to work with when we want farmers to implement these technologies and of course i think that will also apply to future technologies some of the technologies that are moving ahead and being adopted widely at the moment is uh, soil sampling, field mapping, variable seeding, satellite imaging. You can see they have had a slow start, but now they are taking off and I think we will see even higher uh, 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 adoption of these technologies uh, properly. Also, these uh, figures were, 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 were applying to, uh, to uh, arable farming, but of course we also have precision farming in livestock. And I can see that we will have a presentation about that today. So that of course also is an area where precision farming is being uh, adopted. And maybe even to a higher degree some, in some areas than in, in arable farming. Again, the adoption issue very important 70 to 80 percent of all new farm technologies sold in the eu for example they have some of these technologies embedded in their in the system but only 20 30 35 percent are being used so we have an adoption gap here and i think that's uh, something we have to, to 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 look at in the and address actively in the in the future innovation in agriculture is a, a difficult issue because you can be very much locked in 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 how you perceive agriculture to be performed because uh, work operation processes have been carried out in a certain way for the last 200 200 years or, or even longer and even if you new technologies come along you are sort of just making these processes and operations more efficient you are replacing the horse by the tractor etc and even you see when you move into robots you are still carrying out the operation in the same way so we have difficult in redesigning the whole work process because maybe we should turn it all around and look foremost at the at the requirement from the biological system from the plants from the animal and then we should design the technology system and i think that has also been some of the problems we had with precision farming we have came from the technology side and developed a lot of technologies but and then we try to find a place to apply them but and then we for example gathered or collected a lot of data but we didn't valorize them. We didn't know what to do with these data. We didn't have the systems that could actually 
transform these data into knowledge for the farmer, into the decision support for the farmer. And I think that's where we also are today. We have a lot of data, but we need to, make, to work more on how to use these data. Key takeaway points is that we are moving from electromechanics me in agricultural machinery to ICT, IoT platforms, a product focus on the mechanical product also into a ICT platform. There are challenges in terms of connecting all these new systems, a whole new way of doing things, changing of the mindset, both by, by the manufacturer of uh, agricultural machinery, but also by the farmer. We need new uh, retraining, new uh, education and how to, to handle these new technologies. Key issue is also security, ethics, data ownership. Uh, also, we will need to have new uh, ways of analyzing all these data that we collect, for example, in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning. The dilemma is that we have all these data, but we can actually not use them to, to make a complete system optimization because somebody is owning some of these data, another is owning some of the other data, and we need to harmonize all this. And then if we can do that, then we can really optimize the whole system and not just part of the system. One last thing, when you implement new technologies, be it precision farming, smart farming, or other technologies that are coming along these years, the impact, you have to consider two things. Of course, you have the functionality. It has to work. It has to technically work do what it is supposed to do, but it also has to be accepted by the user. And that's where we are uh, missing uh, at the moment, because if you have zero ex acceptance, then you have zero impact, even if you have the most sophisticated machine available. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Klaus, for your contextualization. Now we are going to begin the four presentations that you have for today. So first of all, I would like to invite Ulf Bogdawa to join us in the webinar. Ulf Bogdawa is the CEO of Sky Drones and he will present drones for pest control. Please welcome Ulf Bogdawa. Well, good morning to everybody, Christian. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Claus, it was very interesting to see what you showed to us. It's exactly something that we are dealing a lot here in Brazil, this discussions with a lot of data showing and people not exactly knowing what to do with it. And mostly uh, this technology must be ready to be used by people on, on the, uh, knowledge level that you usually find on the field. You have to see here in Brazil, uh, the, the mean level of people in, in the field is not uh, so educated as is in, De in Denmark. So uh, that makes it even tougher to make uh, technology work. So that is one of the most uh, important things we always take a look because we have also have a very good opportunity because technology is bringing young people back to the field and we are having people going to the city. So I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, field. But I'm going to show you, I have very little time. I'm going to show you some uh, the technology we are developing. We are in Brazil, uh, the oldest company developing UAVs, robots, flying robots. And the last five years, we have focused very much on agriculture. And for that, we have, I'm going to uh, show you this presentation. And um, here we go. Share, here we go. Hopefully it will work, okay. So uh, we have been working with, uh, first of all, imaging, getting images, uh, multispectral and all kinds of images to, for the precision agriculture to be more precise, obviously, to lose, use less chemicals and to be faster on, on uh, fixing issues. 
and that we have done for more than 10 years. Uh, in the last five years, we have focused very much on the precision uh, crop spraying with UAVs. We do crop spraying liquid, solid, and also uh, uh, biological. So what you can see here, let's go this way. Uh, I, I put there a very, very fast story about us. We started in 2008, okay? Um, we wrote the Brazilian UAV legislation. It's very important because we are not a, a university startup. Uh, we are uh, all people from the aerospace uh, com uh, companies, okay? Embraer and uh, Elbit in Israel and, uh, and other places. So the engineers are very focused on uh, this technology. Uh, we we already developed UAVs, uh, fixed wings. You have, can see here in the back is one of uh, our military units for imaging. We are a military company also. And uh, we, are, we started so also some distributing in Brazil for uh, smaller UAVs like DJI. We were the first distributors. And uh, also FLIR thermal cameras and, and uh, technology in that direction. And then we started with uh, crop spraying uh, UAVs. Um, our goal here and the reason why, uh, uh, first of all, I have to thank you for the invitation. Uh, one of the things is showing our technology um, because uh, we have a very, very big difference from the Chinese equipment. Uh, the way the Chinese do their uh, crop spraying in China is very, very different from the way we do it here in Brazil for some reasons. I don't have the time to explain it here, but uh, if somebody's interested, surely we can talk about it. And our main goal is to be the biggest supplier of this technology in Latin America, obviously also having contact with uh, uh, companies outside of Brazil or Latin America. And also we are a very interesting uh, opportunity for investment because we are in scale up at this moment. Okay, you can see a little bit of the opportunities we have here uh, on the market. Uh, 2016, we started with the first spraying systems and then we started with concept, proof of concept, you will see we have a lot of clients already and we have a very interesting, we have some partners, uh, some uh, partners in development uh, with Israel, for instance, for swarming, because one of the technologies here in Brazil to do more in less time is swarming, because here in Brazil we have a limitation on 25 kilograms to be operated uh, in an easy way, okay, because uh, over uh, 25 kilograms, it's a more sophisticated uh, UAV class, and then you have to be a pilot, certified pilot, and you have to have a certified aircraft. We are in a project of 150 kilogram uh, UAV that will be released uh, in about a year and a half. Okay, then you have an idea what's done in Brazil. We have 2,200 airplanes spraying here in Brazil. Brazil is the second largest market in the world. We are just behind the US. And then you, have, you can see you have 4,000 uh, uh, terrestrial sprayers and we have 500,000 back, uh, back sprayers. Okay, that is where we exactly enter with our UAVs because that is a way to get the people out of this uh, hazardous environment and uh, have control of it because the main issue here is have control. We need control of what we're doing and we need feedback of what we're doing. So that is the most important thing. Uh, in the backpack, you don't get it. And we uh, have in Brazil, let's say about 500 drones. That was a little bit, uh, that was on the beginning of the year, but 500 drones. And when you go to China, we have over 20,000 drones already flying. And that is about four to 6% of the possible market uh, that can be reached. So it's a big number of, of UAs that can be flying. We made some comparison why we are using, uh, why we uh, drones are interested. Interesting, uh, very important. We are the first unmanned technology company uh, that has partnered up with the manned uh, um, association, the crop uh, spraying uh, association for airplanes. We are the first one to be part of that association. So it's very interesting. Brazil is the first country in the world that whose uh, uh, airplane companies, crop spraying companies has opened his mind to take a look at the robots flying uh, in the field. So they didn't look at it as a competition, 
but they looked at it as a very, very important opportunity, business opportunity and health opportunity and production opportunity. So that is very interesting. While US are still fighting against it and uh, Australia also, uh, here in Brazil, they were very clear and helped us a lot and that's very important. So the parts that we cannot do with an airplane, we do it safely with the crop UAVs because we can do only one hectare per flight, but we do it in an intelligent way that I will show you later. Uh, we have this precise uh, application. We don't have the occupational hazards because we, uh, the work uh, that is done by one person outside of the field with one UAV usually is the same work like 10 to 20 persons with the backpack spray and the do in, in two hours and we do it in 10 minutes. So it's a very interesting way to do it, okay? We use less chemicals and we don't use fossil fuels, okay? Interesting is that we are just at the beginning of the innovation cycle. So because, you know, all technologies start somewhere in the middle you get, uh, you know, you, you, you slow down the curve and then suddenly you enter in saturation. Those robots, I think, uh, will not enter that fast, at least not in Brazil, because we have a huge opportunity here to go, and I think in the rest of the world also. I, it's interesting in Brazil because we have a very open legislation to use the drones, okay? I know that in Europe, uh, there are some countries that is, that is much, much more difficult. And we are already working with uh, key markets here in Brazil with rice, soybean, corn, sugarcane, uh, that, that sugarcane mostly biocontrol. And a very interesting thing is when you, let's say you have areas there, they are, uh, they are uh, like um, 150,000 hectares big, then you can do a crop uh, only in one uh, certain spot, okay? so. What we do, we send this, the, the crop sprays only to some spots. That is very interesting uh, for the soybean. And then you have pulp and forestry that we have very difficult places to go. And uh, well, as I told you, we are technology development. Uh, we have mapping systems. Um, we work very much for Bayer and our biggest project here in Brazil for uh, identifying uh, uh, crops, weeds, uh, mostly. So, and to put in intelligence, artificial intelligence to make the decision on uh, what kind of uh, weeds we are talking about. Okay, and we put there this uh, uh, development because we also develop solutions, not only for the crop spray, but also, as I told you uh, before, for, for other kinds of uh, needs that are um, used mostly in agriculture at the moment. Spraying, as I told before, since 2016, we do uh, four, who have four models at the moment. We're developing even a, a system now with chemical companies here that you put the chemical tank in the drone just the way that you put an HP a printer with a capsule only. And at the moment, the drone already knows what chemical we have inside. So he decides if he can or cannot spray in that specific area with that specific environmental condition. Because if we have humidity, wind, temperature, whatever, that is not suitable for that moment at the moment to have this uh, uh, crop spraying, it will not do it. So here again, we are taking out uh, all the, um, the complexity of the process, okay? And uh, very interesting, we also have a hub system where we have uh, people can, if you, if you have a big farm or if you own a company that needs to make spray in different areas, you can do that by planning in advance the areas. The people could just go there on the field, put the drone outside, start it, and the drone does it work uh, by itself uh, after it was programmed, okay? I'm um, seeing my time is running out. Uh, just bear very fast that you and I have an idea. The very biggest companies in Brazil are our clients. So that is very important. We already tested a lot. Uh, I think this presentation will be open here. So there are some links, very interesting links about technology development. We have done our uh, system on uh, crop spring, as I told you before. We develop uh, all the firmware, hardware, everything is done here in Brazil. Uh, exactly for those needs. And another very important thing, we also keep our uh, software, we also keep our data here. We don't send them to China. That's another uh, big uh, concern at the moment. And here what we do, we, we construct some parts in Brazil, uh, some parts come from China. Uh, we have sales and we have rental models. So that is very interesting 
to be applied because now chemical companies are not, their intention is not selling chemical companies anymore, the, uh, chemicals anymore. They are more, uh, much more to uh, sell the, the chemicals already on the field. So that's very interesting. I thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, please send it to me. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Uv. That was a very interesting presentation. I'm sure that your technologies are very helpful to improve the efficiency of pest control. Okay, now, yeah, thank you. Now I would like to invite Jose Assi to join us in the webinar. Jose Assi is the CEO and founder of J Assi and he is going to present high precision planting equipment. Please welcome Jose Assi. Okay, thank you. So uh, good morning everyone in Brazil and good afternoon everyone in Denmark or all over the world. So uh, I'd like first to uh, say thanks to Brazilian PTO, special for Renata Ribas to organize this meeting and to have me here, so it's my pleasure to be here. Would be my pleasure to share with you some information about about J. Asti, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Klaus Sorensen, Sorensen from Aarhus University uh, for this meeting and uh, for his uh, very nice presentation. So let's uh, start. Um, just. Uh, are you seeing the? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, uh, JS is a Brazilian company. Uh, we are focused on technology solutions for agribusiness, especially for planters. Uh, we develop uh, seed meters, sensors, actuators, uh, everything related to planter and how we could improve the way we see it in Brazil and worldwide. So we, inv we invest a lot in uh, design thinking and R&D. So um, we have a facility in uh, Goiás where we have our uh, uh, manufacturing plant. We have two uh, distribution center in Brazil, in Paraná and Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, our R&D center in Sao Paulo, because in Brazil, it's not easy to R&D in the country area. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we have incorporated in the US, we have a business unit and R&D uh, small facility in uh, Bloomington, Illinois, where we develop uh, some products to the North American market, special for canola in Canada and uh, corn and soybean in, uh, and uh, strip till in, in the United States. Uh, we are very strong in, in South America. Uh, I guess we are the leaders in Brazil and uh, uh, we, we have been uh, uh, attending the Argentinian market as well because Brazil and Argentina and the United States are, and Canada, uh, the four countries together, are, uh, I think, uh, provide more than 70% of all uh, the agriculture development in the world. So uh, our mi mission is to create the best products in the market that can be considered real artworks. This is very important for us. So uh, we are really focused on uh, uh, design thinking and R&D. So uh, looking for simplicity, uh, easy to use, a low maintenance or no maintenance. <laughs> Uh, robustness, for sure. Performance, uh, absolutely. Performance, high, high performance in terms of uh, uh, including not just performance, but very easy to use. And uh, design in terms of simplicity, uh, easy to use, no maintenance. And uh, so something that uh, I like a lot what Professor Claus said that 
we, we know how how the guys work in the, you know, on the farm so we try every day to to build products to design products that will be able to uh, people is easy to use that people can um, intuitively um, perform the product so we, we like to say that we have no manuals so there is no need for manual. So the product itself must tell the guy that how, how he could work with the product. So uh, it's not easy, but uh, we think that um, is uh, the main challenge. And, and according to Professor Klaus, we are looking for providing the whole package for the customer. It's not easy as well. Uh, we are not working one or two, uh, uh, blockbuster products, but a group of products that could be provided um, together and uh, could be easily managed and uh, with a very, very high performance. And uh, that could be really bring some emotional, positive emotional feelings and uh, results in terms of ROI uh, to, the, to our uh, clients. Uh, our uh, vision is to be a global technology leader in, in agribusiness, especially in planters. So because of that, we, we uh, are in North America and South America. And next year, we will be incorporating in uh, Germany or Netherlands in Europe uh, by next July. So the idea is to have a business unit and in the near future, R&D in Europe. Uh, we have a, a very strong market up there and uh, uh, following our strategic plan to, to be a global leader, uh, it's part of this plan to be in Europe and be successful up there. So uh, I think being in the US and Canada and um, Europe and then Australia and South Africa is not, could be not so profitable as being in Brazil and Argentina. But the point here is uh, we can't not be uh, playing this market because um, we believe that competition and being um, uh, competing the, uh, with the, the, the market that are uh, uh, more developed in terms of uh, uh, precision agriculture, we could uh, develop ourselves and, uh, you know, uh, communicate with all the countries that we are uh, settled so we can uh, bring something more uh, from this uh, strategy. So this is the, the cycle of the development of the products. Uh, so uh, design thinking, R&D, we find a concept, uh, probably feel a pattern, and then uh, we start to try to uh, make the concept something that could be uh, manufactured and be able to go to the market. So it's a, it's a cycle. Many times we come from prototype to research and back to briefing and then concept. So, but uh, what's interesting is that I think we found a way to create a culture of design thinking and R&D within the company. So we we are a very attractive uh, company, not just in Brazil, but in the, in the US. So, so we can attract the best guys, the best engineers that are looking for having a career in terms of uh, uh, technical uh, development. So we invest about 30 or sometimes 35 of revenues in R&D. Uh, it's uh, dropping this number because the company is growing. So, but uh, we, we would like to be very aggressive in terms of uh, new products, new development. So our pipeline is uh, full of very, very new products that uh, sometimes it takes three, four, five years to get to the market. But we believe that uh, it's a, we have this long-term vision and uh, it's something that uh, it's part of our culture. So in Sao Paulo, we have more than 60 people our labs are fully equipped with all uh, the stuff that are needed to develop uh, new products. And, uh, and 
it's interesting because sometimes we need to develop a very fine mechanical uh, innovation. And uh, it's not because actually we develop things uh, for uh, planters and we believe that uh, many of our products, uh, present products and in the future will be higher, have lots of information that nobody has. So uh, sometimes I don't understand why are the guys so eager to, to have the big data because they don't have even the data. So if you don't have really uh, a data that you can trust in terms of uh, planting and uh, how it goes and uh, uh, harvesting uh, and all the numbers and, and then you can develop a software to really understand what's going on. But uh, sometimes I see that many companies go to make the software before have the information. So we are going the, in another way. So this, um, this slide actually is a little bit outdated. Now we have a uh, 5,000 uh, 5, uh, square, square meter in a 50,000 square meter area. Uh, 120 employees in assembly line and a very high level of uh, traceability system is very important for us. We are very proud of this uh, plant manufacturer because actually it's in the middle of the country and uh, we have a, 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 a plant manufacturer to, to assembly electronics, mechanics in a high, very high level. So we are are uh, ready to export for uh, United States and uh, Europe and even Brazil. So um, um, it's uh, for us, it's uh, uh, a leg that is very important to have to be able to really uh, go to the market. Uh, so this is the present products, but I'll be just, uh, I will focus on two products. Uh, the selenium meter is the, a vacuum meter, a, a very high performance, very high accuracy. And uh, I think it's the best uh, meter in the world in terms of soybean, uh, corn, um, sugar beets, um, anything, cotton and uh, edible beans. And a very interesting technology that is leader in Brazil and uh, we launched two years ago in the US. Uh, could be driven by electric motors with uh, wireless communication or mechanical, uh, could be driven by a mechanical cable, no problem, but uh, so um, it's a very interesting solution with wireless communication and the uh, electric motor uh, provides a very unique solution. And uh, the second product that I think could be uh, uh, interesting in Europe is the uh, wireless sensors to monitor dry fertilizer and small seeds. It's a very unique uh, technology, very high precise and high performance sensors. Leader in Brazil, leader in Argentina and about a uh, leader in the United States, North America. And I think we have a, a very strong, a very large market in Europe. Uh, so that's all. I, again, thank you very much. All the guys that uh, work hard for this meeting. And uh, uh, I guess I could uh, uh, present uh, JRC uh, accurately. And uh, I, I'm, um, if, if anybody has any question, it would be, it'd be my pleasure to, to answer and to talk about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Assi. I'm sure that you have uh, interest products to assist farmers to get a high precision metering and depositing of seeds. Uh, now I would like to invite Ana Paula Justiniano to join us in, in the webinar. Ana Paula is founder and scientific director of Justy Biosolutions and she's going to present technology on organic fertilizers. Please welcome Ana Paula. Hi, good, uh, good morning, thank you. Uh, I am a founder and the scientific director uh, of the company Just by Solutions in Piracicaba City. 
we have developed a solution for the agricultural and environmental marketing. This is my partner. Uh, he works in the administration and the coordination of the company. Our expertise is in using uh, specific microorganisms for the uh, development of our solutions. Our product is a biocomposite uh, based on specific microorganisms in the agricultural residues, uh, capable of treating soils contaminated by toxic metals, uh, resulting in remediation of that location. Our solutions bring soil nutritional increase, increasing agricultural productivity and the remediation of the contaminated soil. For corn, there was an increase in the productivity of approximately 47%. And uh, for bean, uh, there was an increase in the productivity and the less accuracy of agricultural pastures. And uh, for forage, Brachiara brisanta, there was an increase in writing. Um, in 2015, uh, there was less lippy of the our Italian tank. Uh, there was a biggest environmental disaster, disaster caused in Brazil. Uh, soil samples were collected from that affected site and in the Dirty Biosolutions Laboratory applications of the biocomposite uh, were made. After 35 days of the analysis, uh, and, uh, the results showed a marketing decreasing in lithium, uh, cadmium, and aluminum, confirming the remedial power of our production. We had support of the Sao Paulo Research Foundation and the University of Sao Paulo and the University of Campinas and now the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much to the National Institute of Industrial Property and the Innovation Center of Denmark in Sao Paulo. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ana Paula. Uh, this product's capability of remedying soils contaminated by toxic metals is very important to both for agriculture and envi the environment. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite Luigi Cavalcanti to join the webinar. Luigi Cavalcanti is doctor in animal science and he's also head of R&D of Intergado, and he's going to present technologies on precision livestock. Please welcome Luigi Cavalcanti. Thank you very much, Christian, for the introduction. I'll start my presentation in a second. Uh, you guys seeing my, my screen? Yes, you can see. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning for you all and good afternoon for people in Denmark. Uh, so I would like to talk a little bit about Intergado. So first of all, uh, where and who is Intergado? Intergado is a company that develops solutions for precision farming and sustainable intensification. Uh, it was founded in 2009 at Contagem, which is a city in the southeast part of Brazil. And our team, we have people with skills on veterinary and animal science, mechanical, electrical, and computer engineering, data science, and web and mobile development. And our solutions are based mainly in uh, into three concepts, Internet of Things, Knowledge Discovery in Databases, and Decision Support Systems. Uh, right now, we are reaching around 3,000 equipment sold. So uh, how and what we do? Uh, actually, uh, we develop equipment that are spread in the farms 
to collect data from animals and also from the environment. And this data is sent to a cloud system where we do a lot of computation and statistics to transform data into information. And eventually this information it will be accessible through uh, web and mobile applications where we uh, uh, provide reports and alerts to our customers. Uh, this whole system was patented in 2009. Uh, we have four main solutions, which we call uh, Intergado Beef, which is a, a system for feedlots, Criatec, uh, a system for uh, which is a system to identify animals that uh, have superior breeding values for feed efficiency. And we also have Intergado Science, which is a line of products to uh, make uh, uh, customized products for animal sciences. So starting uh, with Intergado Beef, uh, the problem here is that uh, feedlot farmers, they have only two informations uh, from feedlot animals, which are the initial and the final uh, weight during the feedlot period. Uh, so they have to, or they only can understand that this uh, phenomenon happens in a straight line like this. But actually, animals, they are not machines, they are uh, quite different, and they will have different curves of growth. Uh, so this will represent different uh, uh, revenues and profits. And also some of the, those animals, they will experience some distress like illness, uh, uh, metabolic disorders, and some of them will recover, uh, some of them will be, be diagnosed, but actually some of them will die if they are not diagnosed in the right time. So. If you are planning and monitoring all the operations based on group average, which is the traditional way, um, a traditional approach in feedlot, you are accepting lower system efficiency and due to this uh, lack of efficiency, you need to confine more animals causing unnecessary environmental impact. You uh, are reducing animal welfare by neglecting animal individuality and also you may uh, lose money due to animal different timing for harvesting. So what our solution do and how it works? Actually, it is a live weight scale uh, and uh, an automatic RFID system to identify the animal that goes to drink water. So every time that the animal goes to drink uh, water in the water bin, we're gonna measure its live weight and register its identification. With this, we're gonna get uh, around uh, up to 10 measurements per day per animal uh, compared to the traditional two measurements in the whole period. With this, with the Intergado system, which we call voluntary wagon system, you're gonna get around 300 measurements. And with this amount of data, you're gonna, uh, it will be possible to fit individual growth models and uh, monitor uh, the animal. Uh, so this is a print of our screen in uh, our web system. You can see the, the animal identification, its current body weight, its current date gain, overall date gain in the period, yet also we can estimate its daily profit. So this is a chart showing each visit as a dot in the fitted model as the uh, green line. So what we are providing here is a way to uh, compute individual profit curves, okay? And what happens is that animals, uh, they have different profit curves. So in this chart, we just, uh, for instance, we split uh, two groups in, uh, from a unique pen and the animals uh, show different daily profits. We can see that there are animals less efficient represented in red, so their daily profit curves uh, reach zero uh, reais or dollars uh, sooner than animals that are more efficient, so they should be uh, harvested before than the animals that are still 
uh, efficient and uh, accumulating profit. Uh, we can also use the system to detect short-term uh, events like this and this, uh, for instance, this animal was growing as expected, but suddenly uh, it decreases its weight gain. So the system alerted people from the farm that went uh, uh, to the pen, identified the animal and diagnosed a uh, hoof problem. Uh, the animal was treated and recovered its regular weight gain. So the next uh, system is that we call it our efficiency. We are reaching right now uh, around 20,000 animals evaluated by the system, which is a, a electronic feed bin uh, made of aluminum and plastic. We have the RFID antenna and also load cells to compute the feed bin uh, weight. And with this system, we can compute daily feed intake, intake per visit, ingestion rate, a lot of uh, information right here, and also social behavior uh, traits. But what we are uh, doing here is actually we are trying to identify animals that are better, uh, they are more efficient in converting uh, feed into product. So, uh, for instance, we are uh, showing two animals here that they have the same daily gain, but they, uh, their intake is uh, very different, okay? So, these animals, this animal uh, here probably is more efficient than this animal over, over here. Also, you can use the system uh, to detect other phenomena uh, like heat. So, you can use uh, the feed intake as a proxy for heat uh, detection. You can also use for sickness detection as well. Um, and also you can uh, make some modifications to measure water and mineral intake as well. Uh, the last product I will show is Criatec. It's uh, pretty much uh, the same for the beef, but, uh, but actually it is a little bit smaller. And here we are measuring uh, weight and height. Okay, so this is more for dairy cats uh, because in the dairy farm uh, there is a expected uh, growth model in the long term. So cats should be in the right uh, height and in, in, in the right uh, weight uh, during its growth uh, phase. Okay, so uh, but in the regular farm they don't have uh, enough information to make early detection of deviations. So sometimes you're gonna see something like this where the animal is a little bit shorter than expected and uh, heavier than expected. And this uh, increases the prevalence of ketosis, it reduces milk yield, uh, and also it increases the odds for other disturbances. So this is pretty much uh, some of our products. I'd like to present some of our main customers. Uh, of course, we have more customers in Brazil and in Latin America, uh, Uruguay and Paraguay. Uh, but uh, in the last few years, we started to expand uh, our customers throughout the world uh, to the United States, uh, UK, and recently Australia. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Luigi. You showed uh, very interesting technologies that provide precision livestock solutions for monitoring the animal's health and behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I would like to invite uh, Professor Klaus once again to make a few comments on this second day of the event. So Professor Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, again, thank you for the, for the different presentations and developments, quite interesting. And I think uh, they all play into addressing different aspects of future farming and also into many of the problems and challenges that I mentioned in, in my introduction in terms of sustainability, usability, user-friendly. Uh, for example, the, the 
the drones for 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 spraying uh, trying to develop new technologies for efficient spraying and also uh, considering sustainability environmental impact uh, the one on the co-design with users the whole product process uh, that we have heard in the in the second presentation that's where you really try to integrate the user requirements and the and the whole implementation phase also in the product and i think that will in the link, that will also help us uh, address the adoption issue that i was talking about in the introduction that the, the users get a more user friendly product and and you will get a higher get a a higher adoption rate in the end on the and of course also on specific issues like organic fertilizer also addressing a key issue in terms of sustainability on the precision livestock i think that was another problem i think or highlighted the problem that was highlighted there the one that all the data we collect, we need to to have uh, to to discover the the relationship in the data, and then develop models and uh, and other tools that help the farmer make decisions. So that's also a product that will that will uh, help us uh, advance precision farming because I, as I was talking about earlier the the we need we have a lot of data but we need to to make use of these data and i think that was an example of that so again i think uh, different development products developed under different conditions but i think they are less central issues in the precision farming uh, smart farming uh, future development uh, and i and as a such, of course, there was, there was there should be a lot of possibilities for Brazilian uh, Denmark cooperation in this in in such issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Klaus. Now uh, we are reaching the end of our second day of webinar, and I would like to, to thank again all the speakers that we had here today and also all participants. I also like to remind all the participants to fill up the form for collaboration proposals. You'll find a link to access the online form in the chat of Zoom. So those who are intended to engage in further co cooperation with any of these five companies we had here today, please don't forget to fill up the form. Tomorrow, we will have here researchers from the Federal University of Minas Gerais presenting agricultural tech solutions with plant biologicals, crop protection, and food fermentation. So thank you all of you again, and we'll meet again tomorrow for our third and last day of webinar. Thank you.